Thank you. It is definitely a pleasure to be here tonight. When I was a child, poliomyelitis cast a shadow over every summer. Newspapers and magazines displayed pictures of its devastation. At the local movie house, the newsreel before the main attraction reported on thousands of innocent children paralyzed. In 1954, my hometown of Kingsport, Tennessee, was selected as one of the sites to test Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. On April 26, I rolled up my sleeves, gritted my teeth, and became one of the first children in the world to get the polio vaccine. I was proud to be called a polio pioneer. Approximately a year later, on April 12, 1955, Jonas Salk's vaccine was announced to be a success. Polio had been conquered, and Jonas Salk became the hero of my generation. Throughout the years, I began to wonder, whatever happened to Jonas Salk? Having achieved acclaim at age 40, what did he do for an encore? I could find no formal biography to enlighten me, so I decided to set out and write one. After many, many years in libraries and archives and all sorts of interviews, I finally uh, started to write the biography. And this is just to begin with a brief summary of his life. On October 28, 1914, Jonas Salk was born in East Harlem. His mother told him he was born with a call, which meant he was destined for greatness. Fairly unlikely for this shy, sensitive, introvert who was a first-generation Jewish immigrant. As a boy, Salk prayed daily that one day he would accomplish some noble deed. But beneath this selflessness was also a boy who craved to have popularity and to succeed. Uh, the, caption under this, the caption under this photo from high school says, Big Shot. <laughs> and his subsequent marriage to a woman from a wealthy Manhattan family. Having just finished his medical training, Salk attached himself to Thomas Francis at the University of Michigan, an eminent virologist. The U.S. had just joined World War II when an epidemic of influenza threatened the troops. This brought back terrible memories of the 1918 Spanish influenza in which almost as many young men died from the flu as died from combat. So in a race against time, Francis and Salk set out to make and test the first successful influenza vaccine. But Salk felt a little stymied by uh, Francis. He wanted to move ahead uh, much faster in improving the vaccine. So he took a position at the University of Pittsburgh. But he soon became very discouraged because what he found is that leaders in the field seemed to impede his every step. In 1947, Harry Weaver, who was the talent scout for the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, lured Salk into the field of polio, and his life changed forever. Now, Basil O'Connor, who was the powerful director of the National Foundation, had appointed a group of elite scientists, which included Albert Sabin, to advise him in how to dispense funds for polio research. Well, Sabin was content to have this young Jonas Salk do some of the tedious tasks. Little did he know that beneath this feigned complacency was a renegade researcher who, with Basil O'Connor's blessing, concocted and tested a polio vaccine behind this very powerful committee's back. In 1954, the National <coughs> Foundation did a clinical trial across the United States of his vaccine, which is one of the largest clinical trials in the history of medicine, conducted solely in children and supported solely by the public through the March of Dimes. On April 12, 1955, when this vaccine was announced a success, Jonas Salk became an international hero overnight. While heads of states rushed to uh, honor him, the scientific committee was, scientific community was ominously silent. The worst tragedy that could have befallen me was my success, Salk later said. I knew right away that I was through, cast out. Well, in the meantime, Albert Sabin was working on an oral vaccine that could be delivered in a sugar cube, which I'm sure many of you remember. The difference was that Salk's vaccine was a killed virus, whereas Sabin made his vaccine with a live, weakened virus. 
and as a result, quite a number of people became paralyzed. Mm -hmm. But despite that fact, in 1961, the Public Health Service recommended that the Sabin vaccine replace the Salk vaccine. Well, Salk was very upset. He called this a risky, politically driven decision. And for the rest of his life, worked as a sole warrior to try to get that decision reversed. Well, Jonas Salk had really become kind of the scientific rock star and he was beginning to wish that he had a little refuge. He started to, to dream of an institute where scientists and humanists could work together and imbue the sciences with the conscience of man. Basil O'Connor supported that dream and uh, supported uh, the funding in order to hire Louis Kahn, who designed an architectural masterpiece called the Salk Institute, located in San Diego, in La Jolla, California, which overlooks the Pacific Ocean. Salk was able to attract a cadre of brilliant scientists and scholars, promising them lifetime funding. But he did face quite a number of struggles. A maverick architect who spent more time dreaming than drawing. His own inept administrative skills, which left the institute tutor, teetering on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. Um, and uh, deposal, eventually, by the very people that he built this institute for. Finally, an institute president who said he could raise more funds with Salk dead than alive. Right. Jonas Salk's life was pretty much defined by his work. That left very little time for his wife and his three sons. His first marriage ended in uh, divorce. His friends were puzzled by his second marriage to French artist Francois Gillot, a former uh, <coughs> mistress of Pablo so, uh, Salk agreed to every one of her provisos to get married, including that she could live in Paris for six months out of the year. <laughs> well, throughout his life, Jonas Salk awoke in the middle of the night with lots of thoughts running through his head, and he wrote them all down in a journal, which he called his night writings. Those became the basis for four books which contemplated men's place in the cosmos. Now, many people could not understand his circuitous uh, ramblings and musings in these books. And he certainly uh, uh, was welcomed anyone who could help interpret his ideas, which would, I would call his torchbearers. They mostly included a cadre of intelligent, young, attractive women. <laughs> <laughs> in his 70s, Jonas Salk entered the AIDS arena. He was mediating a debate, or a, actually an international fight, between two star scientists, both of whom said that they had found the AIDS virus. With no vaccine uh, forthcoming, Salk decided to build a company, or work to build a company, and make his own. His AIDS research was not well accepted by the rest of the scientist community, uh, but he did do something important, and that is that he attracted the media and really moved the field forward by being able to educate the public that AIDS was not a disease just about gay men, but an illness about which they all should be concerned. This is his uh, first patient getting his vaccine. Well, although he was surrounded everywhere he went throughout his life, Jonas Salk was really a solitary man. He wanted desperately to connect with people in an intimate way, but he didn't seem to know how and so he just kept working. In his 80s, he was planning a big trial of his AIDS vaccine when on June 28, 1995, he suddenly died of heart failure. Well now, at this point, my file cabinets and my computers were full of all kind of information about Jonas Salk, and it was time to really sit back and just tell his story. But where to begin? Should I begin at his birth? Should I begin at the moment of his great success? Well, at the time, I was attending a uh, writing residency, and uh, I was telling some of the young writers there that I was working on a biography of Jonas Salk, and they all nodded politely, and it soon became clear to me that no one knew who Jonas Salk was. <laughs> Not only that, they had no concept of the devastation caused by polio before his vaccine. So I decided to start by setting the stage, going back to 1916, when polio struck New York City. 
And what I'd like to do now is just read you the opening pages of my biography. In the summer of 1916, New York's playground stood empty. No children splashed in public swimming pools. None sold lemonade on the sidewalks. No cats roamed the alleys, peering into garbage cans. Troops of sanitary workers in white uniforms hosed down city streets. Fathers hurried home from work, fear imprinted on their faces, averting their glances from the tiny wooden caskets light up outside the tenements. Policemen patrolled the streets. New York was a city under siege. Poliomyelitis had crept into Brooklyn while the public was busy watching the war unfold in Europe. It smothered for a while between Henry Street and 7th Avenue. Health officials barely paid attention, assuming it would soon die out, but it didn't. When the press began to attach names and faces to the disease, the community became alarmed. Helen Downing, paralyzed just before graduation from public school number 134, received her diploma in bed. Five-year-old Frederick Chaplin had made his kindergartens honorable when he went to Coney Island with his brother. Five days later, he was dead. Before long, the names and faces gave way to numbers, and they kept escalating. On June 28th, Health Commissioner Haven Emerson announced that Brooklyn might be having an epidemic. Although a scientist had identified the polio virus eight years earlier, no one knew how it spread. Assuming it behaved like other contagious diseases, the commissioner ordered every family bearing a case quarantined. A placard was placed in the window. Bed linens and clothing were disinfected. Their windows were screened to prevent flies from disseminating the disease. Street cleaners worked overtime to collect garbage and cleanse tenement halls and stairwells. Stray cats, suspected of harboring the virus, were rounded up and exterminated. 72,000 by Thummer's End. The commissioner closed playgrounds and banned children from theaters. He instructed parents to keep the food covered to wash their children's noses and throats with salt wet or daily. But filth and flies and cats had nothing to do with the spread of poliomyelitis. And even with these precautions, more children contracted the disease. <coughs> the illness started innocently enough, a sore throat, a runny nose. At the end of the day, a child spiked a fever, became restless. Then the pains began. Electric shocks that darted through the back, legs, neck, and shoulders. Muscles twitched and spasms twisted him in a peculiar posture. All night, the child thrashed about in his bed, drenched in sweat. His face became pallid. When the fever broke, he appeared to be recovering. A deceitful interlude as a polio virus left the bloodstream and invaded the nervous system. Within a day or two, paralysis struck as abruptly as the fever had, and no one could predict the nature of its onslaught. A weak leg, which improved in a few days, or an arm dangling useless forever. Poliomyelitis impaired either one muscle or a group of muscles, teasing the victim by leaving sensation intact with no motor control. A puzzled child could, could feel his feet but could not move them. Three quarters of those afflicted survived, many condemned to life in a wheelchair, on crutches, or in bed. They joined a generation of cripples. If the polio virus attacked the nervous system higher up in the base of brain, death soon followed. Paralyzed throat muscles impeded swallowing. A sip of water screamed out his nose or drained into his windpipe, causing the youngster to sputter and cough. Unable to swallow saliva, he foamed at the mouth. Breathing gave way to gurgling. As his mother wiped the bloody froth from his lips, he gasped for air, drowning in his own secretions. The struggle over, his eyes rolled back, a few muscle jerks, and the mother held her lifeless child. Poliomyelitis seemed to have a predilection for infants and toddlers. During the second week of July, 412 new cases were reported in New York. The next week, 712. Terrorized patients watched the figures more closely than the stock market. The disease erupted in Staten Island, Manhattan, the Bronx. It didn't distinguish between immigrants and the upper class, and those who could fled. Mothers swarmed into Grand Central Station and the ferry docks dragging their children into crowds they should have avoided. The exodus of almost 1,200 children a day halted when towns began to bar them. In Hoboken, New Jersey, guards were posted at every city entrance. Policemen turned back 150 families trying to enter Hastings on Hudson. Distraught, they returned to New York, where the death toll continued to rise. Families lacking the wherewithal to provide medical assistance at home were ordered to deliver their infected children to Brooklyn's Kingston Avenue Hospital for Contagious Diseases, where they were held in isolation for eight weeks. 
When parents looked up at the dark, looming fortress of Kingston Avenue, many turned away, hi hiding their youngsters at home. Watching a policeman snatch a child from her mother's arms reminded some of the pogroms from which they had fled. By August, every isolation bed in New York was occupied. Many held three children. A baby died every two and a half hours. Fear boarding on hysteria permeated the city. Then, when the weather turned cool, poliomyelitis disappeared just as unexpectedly as it had come. In America's first major epidemic, the polio virus had infected approximately 8,900 in New York, leaving 2,400 dead, many of the remainder paralyzed. Nationwide, it afflicted 27,000, mostly children under five years of age. And for the next 40 years, the carefree spirit of summertime was marred by the specter of this disease, now known simply as polio. Well, in starting a biography, one faces quite a number of challenges, uh, the greatest of which is to actually portray the subject as accurately as possible. As one biographer put it, get behind the legend without destroying the man. In fact, when a reporter once asked Jonas Salt what he wanted his biographer to write about him, he said the truth. Well, that wasn't so easy because Salt created this protective shield which made it hard to comprehend the paradoxes and questions surrounding his life. For example, for a man who rarely said a negative thing about anyone, why does Salk have so many adversaries? Mm -hmm. Celebrity, did he seek it or shun it? Was the ostracism of Salk by the scientific community justified or an act of jealousy? And finally, how should Salk be viewed by history? Was he a misunderstood altruistic man who devoted his life to conquering disease regardless of the personal cost? Or was he a self-absorbed man who cunningly worked to get himself a place in medical history? Well, perhaps he was a little bit of both. You see, I found Salk to be far more complex than the image of America's beloved hero, but far more sensitive and caring than the conniving dilettante that was projected by many of the, in the scientific community. Salk, as a boy, had prayed that one day he would perform some noble deed, and he did. But that same boy wanted desperately to be accepted by his peers, to be popular, to be loved, and he never realized either. So in the end, Jonas Salk's passion to aid humanity trumped his inner needs, and the world is better for it. Thank you.